Thanks very much for that, Lorna. And you've just tightened the whole project by uh, seven years. You've just chopped seven years off it, but I'll come to that. It's, it's not likely at all. Uh, so we're going to move from an individual academic's position, an individual academic situation, and how they've used open, how they've created content, how they've shared it, and how they've been, to my mind anyway, Emma's not in the room, been very authentic about it and very honest about that. And so we move now, and what I'm going to talk about is an institution, an institutional level exercises, strategy, a, an approach that allows the institution to both shift itself and also start addressing legacy issues and what it's going to look like as a national library in the 21st century. Because all of those are up for question in institutions like the National Library. Hence the title, Postcards from the Open Road. I'm going to cover four areas. They're all kind of intersecting and, 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 and cover similar areas and, and, and cover in different ways. But roughly there's four sections to this, four, four areas. The first is a cluttered history. The title of this talk at the beginning was Decluttering the Library, and you'll probably get a sense of why I thought that might be a good title. The second is around what we've come up with as a possible solution for some of these issues and challenges in this cluttered uh, environment we find ourselves in. And number three is absolutely fresh. There's a huge red flag for danger flying over number three there, and it's scary numbers and even scarier solutions for us at the National Library. And I can assure you that we've, we've really just nailed these numbers uh, in the last few days. And then finally, in four, I'll sort of stumble towards some kind of conclusion and try and pull all that together. Being mindful that there's a keynote, there's a, there's a dinner this evening, that there's drinks, and that I'm the obstacle to that. So I will, I, will try and, um, I will try and draw that conclusion quite sharply for you so that you can, you can rush off. Before I move away from this slide, I think it's important to mention a first for the National Library of Scotland. In that I don't think Darth Vader and David Hume have ever been on the same slide before. <laughs> David Hume, you may well know, is Scotland's most famous philosopher, a brilliant historian, a brilliant mind. But he was also a librarian, 1752 to 1757. And he was a librarian at the Advocates Library, which is a predecessor institution to the National Library of Scotland. I have a statue, a little bronze statue of David Hume in my office, and every day I walk in, he stares at me, and it reminds me of the past, and the past of the National Library of Scotland, which is why it's so important that we carve out some kind of positive future for it. And this is just one of my favourite things from our Moving Image Archive. We have, uh, we have responsibility for the, the documentary archive for Scotland called the Moving Image Archive. And we did a competition a few years ago and asked people to Scottify some phrases in film. And this is definitely the, the favourite that, that we all thought was the best one. So cluttered history. A couple of points on that, and Catherine Cronin spoke about this at the, at, the, at the first keynote, and I wouldn't even attempt to try and bring that level of sophistication to the things that she said in such a, such a clear and compelling way. But what I will say is that that uppercase and lowercase, and you'll look open in terms of that definition about technical and removing barriers and all the rest of it, is vitally important, and really it's a key feature of this, uh, this conference today and tomorrow. But really what I'm interested as well as that is this lowercase open about how you drive openness into an institution, how you drive that culture shift and change into an institution that in, in very different ways has existed for 400 years and has massive le legacy collections. So those two in a combination, and it's not the first time, it's not the last time, sorry, that I'll actually have attention in some of the words that, that I actually go through over, the, over the, 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 the presentation. So starting with that cluttered history, there is clutter on George IV Bridge in, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, and naturally a national library is in the capital city. And what we've got facing us is the Central Library. That's the National Library's main building. We've got about six buildings. 
And that's our main destination. When you walk in there, there's 10 floors of stacks below you. So you actually walk in on the 11th floor. We've got the Carnegie Public Library across the road. We've also got, uh, just down the road from there, um, a cafe where J.K. Rowling allegedly wrote the first books of Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series. Now, I think there's about seven now cafes around Edinburgh that make a claim for that. And you'll, have, you'll notice, actually, a few people in the, in the central reservation there, and they're just about to be run down, such as the their desire to get a really good shot on Twitter. We've also got Greyfriars Bobby, which is just along the way there too. A great cultural artefact. He, he died in 1872, very sadly, after 14 years in Greyfriars, protecting and guarding his, um, his, his owner's grave, who died 14 years earlier. So there's a lot of hokum in Edinburgh as well, especially on George IV Bridge, because if you believe that, you really will believe anything. And so the National Library has, is, is living and existing and breathing in the capital where there's a lot of uh, cultural clutter and all sorts of attractions to, to drag people around and away into different places. May I suggest that you look at our plague exhibition if you're here on Friday after the conference, if you're, if you're looking for, for things to do. Fantastic exhibition. And also our Shakespeare First Folio is on show and a happening at the National Library between 11 and 2 on Friday. So go along and look at our first folio and maybe compare it to the, to the Oxford one, which seemed to me to be a bit chewed in the title page and all that. So <laughs> you might want to go and look at the National Library's one, which is in much better condition, <laughs> as you would expect. But just a couple of points on that cultural city, that cluttered cultural city. Edinburgh is a book city. It's a, it's a city built on books. There's two centres for the history of the book. There's also there's Edinburgh First City of Literature. We were the first one. We were the first one. We've got a Robert Louis Stevenson Day. So it's just to remind you that the National Library of Scotland is situated in a city which is really quite vibrant. It's cluttered in a lovely way. I mean that in a loving way for the, for the city. But it also gives us lots and lots of different responsibilities and things we have to do. But we are not just in the city. We're right across Scotland. And there is an expectation that we will provide services and reach out to all of the citizens of Scotland. I like this map because it actually shows you where a lot of the population is. And it shows the population in the central area. It also shows it in the northeast. And I have this idea of the public libraries becoming that re-energised network for content. Higher education libraries as well, but they're, they're really working on all sorts of different, different uh, materials for, for teaching and research. But think of that, about the money that's been put in by the, the Scottish Government over the last few years to bring Wi-Fi to every public library, to bring broadband to all of the homes in Scotland, to really, really work at transforming Scotland. Now, the National Library can't sit in its insular ivory tower and say, that's all very good, I wonder what will happen with that. We have to be thinking, as that rolls out, we need to roll out with content behind it, to offer content to the citizens, to offer different ways of actually using that broadband and using those popular libraries. And the population is going to grow. So our context is a wide context, and it, it naturally is a global context as well. Scottish independence referendum is a, is a feature of, of Scotland at the moment a feature of how we actually look at and view ourselves. And we curated a massive collection of material relating to the Scottish referendum, not just the UK web archive, where we collected a lot of material, a lot of limitations on that material, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later on, but also all sorts of ephemera and various badges and everything. All sorts of things were collected and curated, and that's part of our role as a memory institution, as a memory institution for Scotland. And that's a key word that resonates through our new strategy. Let's just think quickly about a global definition as well. I won't go into any detail about that, but this idea of custodianship of the nation's intellectual heritage, all very, very good, strong words. And every national library, this is the IFLA declaration, every national library aspires to be like that for their, for their country. But lots of national libraries are trying to find their identity in this very busy, busy 
uh, and, and sometimes cluttered uh, information space that we're in. I'm going to mention collections quite a lot, but I'll try and do it quite briefly and skim over. That's just really a nice picture of a number of things. Robert Louis Stevenson, I squeezed in there. I was introduced because I've done, I did a book on that a long time ago. But that book, and I just mentioned that book, it was, it was produced in 1911. I believe it was never taken off the shelf. It was never taken off the shelf in the National Library after it came in as a legal deposit book until I took it off the shelf in 1993 and just thought, that's a fantastic picture. I'm going to put that in that book. And I challenge many of you to go into a bookshop and you'll see it in the cover of a Treasure Island because it can be freely used and all the rest of it. And it can go and travel and everything else. But no one else has got a copy of that because it came into the... And it had to wait its moment. It had to wait from the first decade of the, nine, of the 20th century, many, many decades later, until it was picked up and used. And what a shame it would have been if that was lost. So lots of content we have. Burke and Hare there, you'll see right in the middle, the first serial killers in the whole of Europe. That's a first for Edinburgh as well. <laughs> and they, they didn't. They didn't dig anyone up. They weren't grave robbers. They developed their own fabulous way of doing it. And I'm quite happy to speak to anyone at dinner tonight and tell them how they did it. <laughs> but you may not want to drink anything after that. You may just be on your last glass of wine after you hear how they did it. More seriously, this idea of the dual role of the National Library is a very, very important and vital one. Now, at one end there's preservation, at the other end there's access. This conference here is interested in access. The, na the National Library, most national li institutions, have to play that tension game between preservation and access. Our publishers, who we have the right to claim a copy of every publication made in Scotland, are quite rightly insistent that we look towards our preservation responsibilities. The future guarantor, the preservation copy, the last copy, the security, the restricted, the future use possibly not so much current use. So again, there's a set of ideas and a set of markers for an institution telling you that this is the way we view you as a national library. On the other end, there's an expectation of excellent buildings and seamless and legible services. Ease of use. Ease of use plays well into open as well. This idea of remote access as well. There's a terrible, terrible dilemma for national institutions that have e electronic legal deposit to square the, the, the answer. Or to, I don't know, that's the wrong way of saying it. How do you say to someone in 20 years or 10 years that you have to come to the National Library, a physical institution, to view an electronic resource? I'd love to hear your phrases that I can use when that happens, because I can't really come up with anything yet. And funding is an important thing. It's one of those things that we, we sometimes forget. 90% of the, the money the National Library gets, its revenue and capital, comes from the Scottish Government. It comes with great responsibilities as well. And that little number there, it's a big number, it gouges me many times, 27% reduction since 2008-9. So over a quarter shrinkage in terms of that revenue that enables things to happen, that allows us to feed innovation, allows us possibly to be more open. And we'll come back to that. Our operating context, a context, I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but there really is something there about governance and funding. There's a bit of the strategy, our new strategy that will come to in a few seconds. We made this tough. It was our own tough demand, demands. No one asked us to do it. Well, I kind of asked everyone to do it, but apart from that, there was, there was major sign up to it, I can assure you. And also this idea of that wide user base. We're very, very committed to that idea of democratising our resources, of making them available right across the information space in Scotland. And also this case for open. I chose my words carefully there, an emerging external factor, because I'm not in a higher education institution where that seems to be much more embedded when I was at Edinburgh, much more embedded the case coming through for open access You've heard about open educational resources and all the rest of it. Less of, a, less of a driver, but nevertheless an important driver now. Back to the clutter. 
These are some of the issues, some of the challenges, the institutional culture, some of the things that we have to deal with curating all of this content. Many, many parts of it come with all sorts of different complications as we make that big, big jump to share as much of it as possible through, through sort of digital initiatives. But we've not been sitting idle, waiting on something happening. We've done quite a lot already. We've been digitising material, we've been sharing it, we've been using Creative Commons to make sure it's as available as we, as we, as we can bear it to be or as it, as it is allowed to be. And it's grown organically. We've grown this whole thing organically. And I'll come to some of the, the initiatives that we've done over the last few years towards the end of this talk. But critically, we've also opened the buildings. We've opened the buildings. To my mind, open is also about that physical space, which is the library. And there's this image of the massive, massive library with a tiny little door. And it looks so small. It's a bit like something like An An Alice in Wonderland. You know, the, the space is shrinking, change. And if you look at some of the libraries in Oxford, actually, you'll see that it's a tiny little door to get into the historic library. And then it opens up inside. So that... That, that vision is something that we're working about. How do we open the space up? How do we make the actual physical space more open? But also, how do we drive openness and an, an open and innovative culture inside the space? We've done that through uh, social media. We've got lots and lots of people tweeting at the library now who didn't. Say, use your camera phone, show people what you're doing. Just be open and authentic about what you're doing. You'll see our Twitter feeds have gone up quite a lot. So part of just using that, and that, that sense is maybe inappropriate for, for the, the, the conference, about seeking forgiveness rather than asking permission to do things. Just go for it. Try it out, see if it works. And if you're going to fail, fail fast. So the openness journey has been messy, it's been cluttered, confused right so well we've cleared a lot of that up I think lacking, lacking in coordination or some sense of that as well it's time consuming there was a lack of institutional buy-in and I think that that might be previously my institution is buying into this but that open road and I'll come to that in the conclusion I see that as stately progress along that open road, not getting us a fast pell-mell pace. We need to take the whole institution, we need to take all of the collections, or as many of them as we can as we do, as we go along. And we need to upscale. As we upscale, we need to declutter. It's very, very administrative heavy, lots of transactions around rights and processes, and reuse less so. And we need to be be careful about how we map it. We have a board. We have a board that have got different views about these things. We have to manage their expectations as well. And we have to beg and borrow the best. Shakespeare did it. Why can't we do it? We do envy and admiration very well at the National Library of Scotland as well. And these are, these are some, of the, some of the institutions that we think are doing fab stuff, fantastic stuff. Uh, New York Public Library, really, really interesting things they're doing with some of their content. Also the Bibliothèque Nationale. The Welcome Library, I've got, I've got a separate comment to make on the, the Welcome Library, so I'll leave it there. But the National Library, the, the, National, the, Brit the British Library, look at what they've done with the me Mechanical Curator. Terrific stuff that was the result of the project with Microsoft, which lasted for a short period of time. But what they've done with those images and and pushing them out and, and allowing them to be used. Very, very interesting. But really, the Welcome Library, what they've been doing over the last few years in terms of upscaling their activity and pushing content out, working with the Internet Archive, is really something that we're keeping a watchful eye on as we consider how we get down that, that, that route as, uh, in, in terms of upscale and digitisation. And in Scotland, you see lots of really quite wild things happening as well in the commercial space. And this is one of my favourites over the last couple of weeks with Brewdog, uh, just basically putting their whole recipe, recipe list for every beer they've made. Now, Brewdog, if you, if you don't like beer or anything, that's fine. But the, this, is, this is important because they are, pro rata, the fastest growing company in the whole of the UK at the moment. And what they've done is they've, they've just basically pushed out their 
they're basically their intellectual property. They said you can use it, do what you like. And if you look at that, it tells you exactly how to do the whole thing. Now, what are they saying by doing that? That's a huge, huge risk for them. So there's lots of examples out there that, that are affecting even institutions like the National Library and what effect that will have. False dichotomy, Carl. Um, this was mentioned in the first keynote, I think, about there's no open and closed. It's that messy space in between. And that's, that's the same as an institution as well, how we deal with all of that. We don't see that as closed and open. I mentioned a few things. Some of the closed things, there's not a lot we can do about it in the short term. But in the long term, that commitment to further and more and innovative openness is, is, a, is a given in our new strategy. Quickly on the strategy itself, we, we felt that there might not be any interest from the press. And then we came up with a few messages about what we plan to do. And we did very well, actually. We got a lot of media impact for, for the strategy when we launched it last September. But things got slightly muddled in that media space, as they, as they often do. Um, and the, the, the one that, that made me laugh and then cry was that the National Library would digitise 24 million items. And even with like, the great ambitions that we've brought to the institution in the last uh, year or so in thinking about how we could actually transform ourselves... We won't be able to do that. Um, and so that was a, a, a slight exaggeration, probably the first time the press or the evening news have ever done that. And so the actual figure is a third of the whole of the corpus of the National Library, and I'll come to that in a few seconds. That's a strategy. You'll be absolutely delighted to hear that I'm not going to enumerate this and go through it and read out every part of it. All I'm going to do is just touch quickly on the things that I think are important in relation to what I'm going to talk about about these scary numbers as I come to that. A lot of it's about improving access. And what we didn't want to do was put something in that just became this lovely warm words about improving access and doing this and, and reaching out and yet. What we wanted to put was a scary number, something that would terrify us over the next few years and actually commit us to it, something that would energise the organisation. And what we came up with was this idea of complete, complete a full list of the library's holdings. Hidden collections, every library's got one, few librarians talk about them. We're going to make all of it available and, well, we're going, we're going to catalogue all of it use metadata and all the rest of it, to make it available so there's full disclosure of that content and also the total corpus, a third of it will be in a digital format. And again, you'll, you'll see my scary numbers in a second. You'll see how much effort that is going to take to do that. And underneath it, there's, there's some other things. The bottom one, 2.2, will may well come back to haunt me over the years about making that material globally available. That is a big, big ask for it, some of the limitations that I've already spoken about. Promoting research is dead centre now to the National Library. It was, it was kind of airbrushed out of the conversation for a few years. Absolutely central to what we do and also supporting learning. And reaching out, I just mentioned, I just dissed reaching out and now I brought it back in again. A key thing that we want to do as well is we've got all of these buildings that we look after and we've got a website and we've got web services. We want to bring parity of esteem for both of those. So the attention of the institution needs to be on both of those. And we want to, in some senses, recalibrate the resource that we put into it to make sure that as we develop these services and we bring this content through, it's actually quite clear how you can access it. Not just in our our web space, but in other places as well. And I've got a very sophisticated design for the website towards the close of this presentation that I'd like to share with you. Unfortunately, my numbers have gone slightly odd because this is coming out on work, but I think you can still see it. Does that look okay up there? No, it's, it's, it's gone, a bit, gone a bit funny. So really, these numbers very quickly, the next three, three slides are just about scale. The first one is 
physically we've got 26 million items at the moment and it grows by about 800 daily. That's the, that's the figure. You, the rest of it you don't actually need to know. Below that, born digital is this illegal deposit I was talking about. At the moment that's 1.5 million. It's growing, I feel, exponentially. It's going up by 800,000 a year at the moment, and we do that in partnership with the other legal deposit libraries. So those are the two figures that I'd like you to hold uh, in, your, in your head at the moment. This is other content that we have. That one at the top is a big, big thing for us in terms of in-perpetuity con content that we've purchased over, over time. We need to think more seriously about that and how that plays into, into our space. And then under that, the UK Web Archive. If you're interested in that, the UK Web Archive is part of the illegal deposit, and it's very locked down. It's millions upon millions of URLs, but very, very locked down. You have to consult it in a legal deposit library. And if you look at the British Library's um, uh, open UK web archive. It's about 15,000 websites. And they've gone through the exercise of getting it as free and open as possible. And it's millions upon millions of hits every year. I don't know of a starker contrast in terms of closed and open uh, as, as regards the resource. The scary number is 4 million. And 4 million is what we need to produce, or we need to digitise, or get into digital format, probably for our, from our ana analogue collections over the next 10 years, and it is 10 years, despite what Lorna said earlier. I can't accept that challenge of doing it in three years. <laughs> it will take, it'll take, it'll take every effort we've got to do it in that, that longer period of time. And that's the kind of content we're talking about. The one at the bottom about born digital illegal, we have to have a tension between that. We can't do that exercise without thinking about this electronic content that we bring in, that we curate, that the government pay for. So we've brought tension to those two. But the scary number at the moment is 4 million. That might go up, it might go down, and we've forecasted what the born digital illegal deposit will look like over that 10 year period as well. That is still a massive ask for us. You really are talking about us going up like 10 times, 15 times what we do at the moment over that 10 year period. What it will do is transform the organisation and it will transform what we do. Because it will take us from probably the bottom scale of, or the bottom of the scale of national institutions across Europe that are moving analogue to digital through digitisation and sharing and doing OCR and all sorts of other things, probably to closer to the top. How are we doing it? We're working on it. We're working on it at the moment. The numbers are there. And we, we're really at the point of designing quite an interesting li li library-wide digital production programme. And it will be inevitably, because that's what it is at the moment as we upscale it, commercial, in-house, bespoke. There'll be manuscripts and archives at this end. There'll be, there'll be really mass industrial digitisation at that end. That's the network we've got at the moment. But what we're doing for the first time is coordinating all that, bringing it all together and seamlessly running it right, right through the organisation and also costing it up. How much does it cost us to do it? Because we need to do 10 times this. And it's part of their work on actually revealing those collections. And part of the reason we want to do it over 10 years is because we need to give ourselves some time to do it. But also, the National Library will be 100 years old as, as a founded National Library in 1925 by 2025. And I don't think we can celebrate that without having a dramatic shift in the nature of the content that we offer the citizens. We cannot do that and say, we're going to refurbish a building and we're going to put a plaque up. We need to do something that is really quite dramatic. What we're also doing is resetting the library and the funding. Thinking seriously about that. Restructuring at the moment, we're in the process of doing that. Funding, we're working on an escalator about how much needs to be done. We think we need at least a million in the next couple of years 
um, every year for absolutely baseline big bet on this and probably need more than that. Looking at the welcome and looking at some of the other institutions that have done this, we actually need to put more into that. We're also working out, and this is a big, big thing for us, how do we shift our donors and supporters from continuing to support heritage acquisitions? If you Google the National Library of Scotland that puts into a search engine, you'll hear that we bought a breviary recently. The Sweetheart Breviary. Beautiful, beautiful book. Just in the 13th century. Gorgeous book. And we do okay in raising the, the huge sums of money to get that. We, bought, we brought the John Murray archive to Edinburgh. Cost 30 million. We do okay. That was a painful exercise. And it's, they're a fabulous bunch of people that we work with there. But how do you open the minds of donors and say, digital is the thing. This is what we need to do next. And that's a really, really difficult thing for an organisation to do, which is steeped in heritage, which has the first books printed in Scotland, a Shakespeare first folio. We've got all of that content that just opens people's eyes. So how do we make that shift? So we're thinking on various things in terms of a fundraising campaign, but we've had discussions with our foundation, our charitable foundation, and they've nodded and said, OK, we get it, we see it's in your strategy, we should see that's what you're, what you're going to do. And the language is beginning to shift and move as well. So decluttering the library will take time. And these are some of the things that we've done, uh, we've done over the last few years. Work, working with the Internet Archive, we've got 5,000 uh, items on the Internet Archive. This is the usage, very, very good usage. Excellent, and it's it's broken new ground in terms of how the library thinks about its content. Also worked with Wikimedia. We had the first Wikimedia in residence in Scotland at the National Library of Scotland. That wasn't mentioned earlier, I noticed. <laughs> and lots of images have put up, been put up there as well, and they're heavily used too. So there, there's, there's, we're breaking ground in terms of this sort of cultural imperative in the organisation for thinking about being more open. But really, that's just, that was just the sort of short exercises to we move to this really upscaling uh, initiative that I've spoken to you about. As I draw to a close, I'd like to spotlight our map library. And just, it, it, to me, it gives a it gives a kind of exemplar or a, a nice little case study of an institution like the National Library. Over the last few years, they've digitised 140,000 maps. They've done it in a very innovative way. They've, they've, they've got themselves involved in commercial partnerships. Boris told me to stop. I didn't realise I'd gone over. I was looking at my words. OK, I, I'm going to stop quite soon. <laughs> I won't go into any detail, but terrific work being done there. Google Analytics off the scale in terms of what they're doing. They actually drive more traffic than our main website. Some fantastic pictures that Lorna won't let me show you, but I'll canter through them really quickly. Gordon's map of Edinburgh, 1647. Gordon's map magnified by the good people of the map library, some of the fantastic stuff that they've done there. John Slazer's map, 1690. Edinburgh Castle, zoomed right in. You can do that on the website using IIIF. Fantastic stuff that they're doing. So there are good stories to be told in the National Library. I was going to go into great detail about this complicated website that we're thinking of designing, but I'll just briefly mention what I think it might look like over the next few years. Services, stuff, and data foundry. The data foundry is where a lot of the open content will go. Not only open content that I've spoken about, but how do we run our buildings? How do we manage down the environment? How do we green all those buildings? We've done a lot of good things with that. We're putting the data in there so you can look at it and reuse it and all the rest of it. The data foundry part, the stuff is obviously what I've been mentioning. But the data foundry is a ferocious animal. It needs to be fed. And so that's the, that's the kind of view you have to have of it. And if you design your space like that, it needs to be fed stuff from the stuff part and from the services part. And overall, it will change the organisation. So that's the, 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 the current view of what the, the website might look like. The road to open. 
it's zigzaggy for us. There's potholes, there's all sorts of things. And there's lots and lots of people down that road cheering us on and some of us, some, some of them booing us, saying you're not going fast enough, you should be going that way. But what we've done with our new strategy and with some of these numbers that we've crunched, we've given ourselves a real purpose over the next five to ten years that I think, using open and using all sorts of different methods, I think it will give us a new National Library of Scotland for the 21st century. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Do you mean the metadata? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's one of the biggest issues in the whole of this digitalization. Because then it, it can, it's very difficult to be reused 10 years from now. Well, we, our metadata is, is open, it can be searched, it can be reused. Um, our, our database will be developed. We haven't quite worked out a delivery me mechanism for the actual digital content. We've just joined the IIIF consortium. We're actually going to be redesigning, um, uh, well, we're be going out to procurement for a new library management platform, which will be end-to-end -end and it will manage all of that data and information. Uh, what we will do is follow the, the sort of, uh, international standards for all of this as well. Um, that's about as much as I can answer in relation to that. Question over here. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's uh, something that keeps me awake at night. But I'm, I'm really glad and happy that I've got a lot of technical friends, and we've, we work with the British Library, we work with the Legal Deposit Libraries. Um, we're, actually, we're actually involved in a, in a project with um, uh, Eduda in, in Europe. Um, we're putting, I think, about half of our content at the moment into that, and in triplicate, we're testing it. We're again working with uh, international standards, doing te uh, testing and research. I can't guarantee that all of this content, especially analog to digital content, will be available in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But what is important is that certainly the analog to digital, as we do to the best standards we can, we use the metadata properly and well, and we develop it, we put it in the right spaces, but also that we work on digital preservation and how we can recover that material, which might mean that we strip back some of it. But can I say also that, like I said it keeps me awake at night, it doesn't really, because I'm a historian as well, and when you look back the way, lots of things get lost. Lots of things. The body, the body leads called. I don't want to mention this again. I'll, I'll use another example. <laughs> Things get lost. Things, technologies become obsolete. And the, the, the sort of methodology for digitization, the drive for us is to open up the organization, is to open that content up, and to, in parallel to work as closely as we can with ensuring that that content will be available, will be migratable and it can be stripped down and recreated when we have to do it. And that's about as much as I can do. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an enthusiastic proponent of it will all be here in 50 years time. But what we will have is a, a number of institutions 
that are massively committed to making sure that it is, including the National Library. Thank you very much, John. I think we're going to have to draw up to proceedings here. I think we spoil all of this afternoon. Um, so I'd just like to thank John for such a really inspiring keynote. Well, also, that I'm actually traumatised by the situation that's going to be very old, like young men. But how do you However, thank you for coming here today. Uh, it was really inspiring to your talk. I think um, the higher education sector could learn a lot um, from listening to the kind of questions that libraries um, are asking. So, we can just um, good job. Um, traditional round of applause.